coming to you today with a video on Stellar Conquest, which is the version that I'm looking at is the Avalon Hill version. I think this is the 1984 version. It was published originally by Metagaming, I think, in 1974. And the two versions differ. I've seen the list of the counter manifest for the uh, metagaming version and the Avalon Hill version, but I haven't compared the old rules, so I don't know. There are some differences in rules as well as the equipment and units, but I'm not going to be referencing any of that here. So we're just going to be looking at this Avalon Hill version, and this is a um, it's a society game. It's a game of galactic colonization and expansion. And it plays, let's see what they say here. I think it plays two, three, or four, right? Two to four. The map scale covers a small part of the Milky Way galaxy, and we'll look at the map soon. But everything in this game is hugely abstracted and hugely large. So when you see a counter and it has a one on it, a colonization counter, for example, that refers to one million people. Every number you see on those counters is in the millions. And indeed, the map is um, part of the Milky Way. The uh, playing time, four to six hours, I would say indeed that is true. And we've got 520 counters, rules, uh, player record pad. There is some bookkeeping in this game. Task force cards, which we will see. And we can see here medium complexity and medium solitaire suitability. So you may wonder, well, why am I doing this game on my channel, which is primarily a solo channel? The reason is, there's two reasons, really. One is that I'm very interested in society games or games of culture, games of largesse in some way. And that is definitely modeled here. Secondly, there are two very convincing solo rule sets that were published that I'm going to be referring to. Um, they're very different in what they attempt to do. This Alone in Outer Space one, a solitaire variant for Stellar Conquest by Charles E. Drake, attempts to basically model through the grand rules a four-player game or a multiplayer game, I suppose. I think overall this game is plays best probably when you are dealing with four different factions or four different um, colonizers because the scale is so large that um, with less than that you have very little interaction. There was another variant published called Fate of Empire, a solitaire variant for Stellar Conquest by James Werbeneth, and that is quite different. What this does is, in effect, create a pirate system whereby you are exploring. Um, this is a 4X game. I guess I should have said that earlier. But during your exploration phase and all the phases of the game, you are potentially interfered with by individual pirate ships that come and have various effects. And that is the effects of that is modeled um, in this. They're called swarms and where they swarm and how they attack you. So the second solitaire variant deals with creating an AI at the micro scale. The first solitaire variant controls or creates um, a pretty convincing AI at the macro scale. And I thought I would originally incorporate both of them. I've sort of gravitated more toward this one, and I'll show you when we get to the next portion of the video where I am sort of almost not quite mid-game. But this video, unlike some of my other ones, is going to be more just an exploration of what I'm doing with the game, how I am incorporating the available solitaire rules and what they highlight and the ways in which the system that is both the basic game and the solitaire rules come together to provide, I think, a fairly rich and not that um, mechanical simulation of running an empire or attempting to run an empire to colonize the Milky Way and to create your engine of production and war and funding for your further expansion. So here we are with my map. It 
is turn 13 right now. It's a 44 turn game. And if you think that sounds long, you're right. It is pretty long. The key to the game is that every four turns, so 10 times a game, is a production turn. And really what you are doing in this game, as I said, it's a game of, of engine building, of an empire building an engine to fund your empire through various weapons research and technology research and basic ship speed research to increase the number of hexes you can go per turn of movement. And you are doing all of that and tallying the results every four turns. So again, 10 times a turn, and then you are generating um, IPs, which are industrial points to then spend on various upgrades and weapons that you can get or technologies that allow you to colonize, say, barren planets as if they were not barren, things of that nature. So let's take a look first, before we get into the details of how I'm doing this solo, of the basic components and how they work together, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's going on here specifically. I'll note right away, though, for those of you that are wondering, I have brought in to this game counters from Space Empires 4X, and I've done that because it makes sense to me... Um, it's less confusing to me to see what's going on. And Space Empires 4X really owes a lot to Stellar Conquest. If you're familiar with that game um, and this game, you can see the similarities. The scale is somewhat different, and there, there's a lot of differences, but there were enough similarities that I could use some of the counters, and I'll talk about how that's done in a minute. The basic thing that you're doing initially in this game is exploration of stars. And you can see on the map there are pre-printed uh, star systems that are color coded yellow, orange, green, and red to the O, oh, and there's blue also, that's very important. Those designate mostly mineral rich uh, planets, not all, but the uh, blue stars have a higher concentration of mineral rich planets, which produce more industrial points for you, so they're really good to explore. In any case, these star cards are up here at the top, and exploration is simple. It's what you do initially. You move onto a star, and then say you move to this orange star, you simply pull this, the topmost card, and see what you get. In this case, there are two planets that could potentially be colonized, and they tell you the orbit number around the star and some basic information about the planet. Uh, so we have a subterran planet here and a barren planet here. The number at the, of uh, this 40 million and 10 million refers to the maximum number of colonists that can occupy or live on the planet. So part of the strategy of the game, it's pretty easy to discover stars. It's a lot harder to populate them efficiently and effectively to their maximum size. And you will be gaining in the production turn more industrial points per population in the millions that you have, and you will also be gaining some, um, I can't remember what they're called, but basically like emigration uh, population to move out into other stars. So it's an important strategic point not to try to um, water down your population too much and to concentrate where you can get them onto stars that will produce for you. Now, a barren planet, for example, I have chosen the barren planet markers, if you can see, let me see one that you can actually see here, to designate, um, here's a barren planet, for example, and there are barren planet markers from Space Empires 4X. In the rules of Stellar Conquest, quite oddly, I think, they state that all of the stars that you find, or excuse me, all of the planets that you find, despite the fact that there's an orbit number mentioned, are to be understood to be on this same hex. Now, I don't see how that makes any sense, and it's very confusing to me. That is the one rule. Uh, for the most part, I'm following the rules, but that is the one rule I've completely changed. Um, and those of you that are strict adherents to this game may find this to be not to your liking, but I just didn't see how to play it any other way. So for example, if I were to pull this card and be exploring this star, I would indicate that there's going to be a subterranean planet at orbit four. So four counting here, one, two, three, four. So in this orbit, and then I'll use a basic D6 roll, one, two, three, four, five, six, to determine where that star is. So let's say I rolled a two, 
I would place this subterran planet with a maximum population of 40 million at orbit four in the two line, one, two, three, four. It would go right here. And I would do the same for this planet. And that is how I ended up populating all of these as I played through the first uh, 13 turns of the game. So how do you keep track of all of this? Well, here are some examples of my player record sheets. This is represents green, and actually I think green is onto two, two sheets now. I must say that I didn't really go by my own advice that I just gave, which is not to explore too widely and spread yourself too thin, because I did in effect do that, at least in terms of exploring all of these various planets just up until this turn. And I indicate here, there are some fan, these are the original sheets. There are some fan-made sheets online, and typically with older games when there are fan-made sheets or player aids, I find that they're an improvement. The ones that I found online they were better in certain ways, but worse in certain ways. So I just stuck with the originals here. And I'm also using some notes off to the side. The one thing that is key that does not, you don't have a space for is to indicate, for example, if the planet is barren. So a B here for barren. Here's um, Turan, uh, minimal, I guess that's minimal um, Turan there, sub Turan, and so forth. Because I am using the named counters from space empires, I can actually indicate the name of the planet because there is no other way to correspond them. You could write the hex number, of course, but um, I've written the name down. The number here is the card number. So each card has a number here and it doesn't really have meaning in the game, but I've just written it down in case, you know, something happens and there's just a lot going on here. So I don't want my cat to ruin everything um, and not be able to put it back together. I indicate the number here, which is the maximum population that the planet can house. And as I'm moving through and colonizing, I write down the number, the population number there. So at the, currently, Tempe, which is somewhere, um, I'd have to find it, has 10 million colonists on it. And there is, uh, I don't know whether you can tell, I did some mathematical calculations during the production turns that I sort of erased here. But um, what it amounts to is using your population to determine what a population increase that you get is. And the increase is various depending on the actual terrain of the planet. So if you're on a barren planet, you may not have a population increase unless you have certain technology that allows it. If you're on um, just a regular Terran planet, you have the maximum population increase that the game allows. And then, as I said, you are going to be taking that population and emigrating some of it out and getting a bonus for doing that. And all of that is determined by bookkeeping. And there is a fair amount of bookkeeping in this game. It is of its time in the sense of it was originally published in 74. As I said, I'm playing the version from 84. And, you know, is there more or less bookkeeping than in Space Empires? That's hard to say. It's, it's a little bit different. I almost feel like it's less, but you're working at a macro level. So again, every number practically that you're using here is in millions. So when, you know, you've got a 10, it means 10 million. Um, and because of that, the level of calculation, the individual calculations, I think maybe are slightly different. But Taking a closer look at the task force card, each player gets one of these. And the task force that are referenced here refer to counters that have letters A through zero, A through O, that you can place on the map in lieu of representing individual counters. We haven't looked at the counters yet, but we will. Um, but in order to avoid too many counters on the map, you can just put your counters here and then the corresponding task force counter goes on the map. I sort of do use that a little bit. Um, and the key here on the rest of the card is the indication of how you spend that money or those um, industrial points that you gain. It will tell you, for example, you've got options of spending it on ship speed to increase the number of hexes that you can move. You start out moving only three hexes a turn, and if you remember the map, you can see that that's pretty slow. So you can increase up to eight hexes per turn, but you need to you need to spend these industrial points to do it, and it will tell you um, if you advance um, 
slowly through the levels, you have a discount. So if you have the three hex speed, it costs 30 to get the four hex speed. Um, if you don't, it costs 40. If you have the um, four hex speed, it costs 40 to get the five hex speed. Otherwise, it would cost 55, etc. There's weapons research that you can do. And this includes creating missile bases and fighter ships. Well, actually, this isn't really creating them. This is doing the research to then purchase them. So there's a there's a difference there. So for example, a missile base will only cost you four IPs, but you cannot buy it unless you've already done the research to build it and to use it. And that goes that is true of all of these things here in the weapons research area. And indeed, in all the areas, you are di differentiating between research and actually purchasing something. Certain things like ships like colony transports, you can simply purchase at a, at a price of one IP, more scouts, um, corvettes, which are some fighters and actual things called fighters and death stars, which are your biggest fighters, you can simply outright purchase. But if you're trying to build things, you need like bases, um, you need to do the research first in order to part purchase them. Technological research, which is what I have focused on a bit, is very important. This controlled environment technology, which is CET abbreviated in the game, this will allow you to colonize those barren planets as if they were minimal ter ter Terran. So I mentioned that the Terran nature of the planet dictates your population increase. The population increase is the basis upon which you are gaining industrial points moving forward. So you want to increase your population by colonizing more and growing. Putting colonists on barren planets without this technology does not allow you to gain any industrial points for that. So if you discover a lot of barren planets in your empire, you may wish, as I have done, to inv invest in purchasing this CET for a cost of 25, which will then allow you to um, colonize those planets, the barren planets, a little bit more effectively. It's not going to be as effective as if they were regular uh, Terran planets, but at least you'll get something out of it. You can also invest in industrial technology and this will allow you to build factories on your planets. Um, and again, factories are going to contribute to the uh, overall industrial points that you get from that colony. Very important, every production phase to get as many as you can. And there are other things, we won't go through all of them, that you can build. But they all cost money, and the money or the IPs that you are able to spend is what is generated for you every fourth turn. It's important to understand this concept of every fourth turn because what can happen and what has happened to me sometimes is that if you if you run out of things to do and you haven't yet calculated your um, IPs and you haven't you're not able to to build more or spend more or move colonists around, there's a little bit of dead time, I think. And that could just be my flaw in playing this. I'm not really sure. I certainly don't have a huge, can't claim to have a huge grasp on the strategy in this game. And um, part of me feels like I could be playing it wrong. But uh, in any event, it is important to note that these costs, while they don't seem very high, it's very dear. It's hard to get this money. It's hard to figure out how to move your colonists around to their maximum effect. And we will take a look at how that happens next. We're back here after a bit of a break. I've been struggling with how to continue with this video because this game is just so abstracted and large that the gameplay, which I'm finding very involving, is very, very difficult to film because a lot of it does have to do with filling in the charts and the production turns and things of that nature. The other issue that I've discovered is, as I mentioned, I've been playing with three players. I was more or less playing green and having the AI that I'll talk about play red and yellow. And in my further reading about the game, paging through issues, old issues of magazines from back in the day when the game was released, there was 
one variant that was talking about game balance. And I came across this mid game here and realized that I should have probably been playing this differently. And what this was suggesting was that due to the vastness of the game, if you're playing two player, you could use just half of the map to kind of force more interaction earlier on in the game between the two sides. So that in essence, uh, without that interaction, without that conflict, what you're doing is simply building some sort of technological military engine to run, but never really using it. Um, or if you were playing three player, which is what I'm doing here, you would set up the third player as beginning in this planet or this star system here and working its way out as opposed to on any of the normal three entry points, one of which you can't see down here, which is what I did, unfortunately. The reason that I played three player to start with was because, as I mentioned earlier in the video, one of the two solo variants that I found involved at the micro level having pirate ships coming in and attacking the individual colonizers. And I thought, well, I'm going to save blue uh, to become the pirate ships that can attack the three empires that are trying to expand here. That was my plan originally with going with three as instead of four, which would have made the most sense probably. Um, and then I kind of abandoned ship as it were with that variant because it didn't really mesh in terms of the scale of the game overall and certainly not with the variant that I'm using. So what I want to show you here as promised, but I'm not sure how much I'm going to go beyond this, are some of the counters. So you have a sense of actually what is in the game and I think I'll go with yellow. That's probably going to be the best to see. The main exploration and movement of your population is controlled by these colony uh, ships. And as I mentioned, when you see a number here, one in this case, this means one million. So you have colony ships that can transport one million, three million. I think your biggest ship has, there is a 20 million ship counter here. These are non-combat ships, they cannot fight. And in fact, when you are doing exploration with them and with your scout ships, which I will find somewhere here, you are subject to, here you go, this is a scout ship, you are subject to um, military intervention, and if you're not protected by a warship, uh, bad things can happen, basically. The scout ships are useful for exploration because they, unlike any of the other ships, can explore an unlimited number of hexes beyond something here that is called the command post. And you can place these wherever you want, but you can only travel within eight hexes of them as you venture out of your uh, home base. So you must be placing these along to travel with anything other than a scout. I mentioned the task force and these are keyed to the task force card that I showed earlier by letter so that if you wanted to represent a number of different counters with this for example, number G or letter G, you would place your individual counters on that card that I showed you earlier. You have your fighter ships. These are some combat um, ships. Again, very, very basic counters because this is all so abstracted. The most powerful warship is your Death Star warship right here. And um, you have some corvettes and they are right here. And that's it. I mean, the counters are extremely basic and the information on them is pretty minimal. I'm going to move back here because as I said, the crux of this game has to do with creating systems that will produce industrial points for you that will allow you to produce more systems. Ultimately, the victory points in the game as written are determined by how many Terran planets you are occupying at the end of the game and that not the industrial points per se. The industrial points are needed to generate the engine to get your population out, to occupy the planets, and ultimately to have conflict with the other players uh, where you can 
overtake their colonies, overtake their planets that are the most habitable. And that is ultimately how you win because you get three victory points for every Terran planet that you control at the end of the game. Let's just take a look a little bit closer at this solitaire variant. Um, this is going to be for diehard viewers only because we're literally looking at a three ring binder here. But this is one of the most convincing solo variants for a, for a large scale game that I've ever seen because what it does is it provides you with guidelines for the generalized priorities of various cultures. So for example, we have the research priority table here, and this is going to dictate where among the choices you can place your efforts to use your IPs that you have. And it further differentiates between war and peace. And in this variant, which is based on a four-player game, uh, and I had to adapt it a little bit already because I was using a three-player game, but based on the four-player game and based on the ultimate population level in millions in the game at any given time after any given production turn, you are determining whether peace exists, whether there is limited war, whether there is outright war, because the more population that you have in the galaxy, the more crowded it is, and the more likely it will be to have conflict. And so that is modeled here. And then based on whether you are at peace or at war, the economic and research priorities are taken care of for you. It's, it's a roll of a, of a die, so it's randomized, but you are given a theme, basically, for the spending of your um, IPs. There is also a transport policy priority list that will dictate where you move your colonists to, and this follows basically the theme of the game, of the basic game, in terms of what is going to be most productive for you. So the mineral-rich planets that are colonized are the most productive to start with, so that's the first priority in transporting new people until you reach that population limit. And then it moves down to mineral-rich planets that are uncolonized, to Terran planets that are uncolonized, and then various Terran planets that are colonized at a certain percentage of the maximum population that I showed you was given on the cards. There are further rules for what happens when there is conflict because sometimes you could encounter another colony and not necessarily go to war. You could simply have a peaceful encounter or some sort of misunderstanding. There are also uh, ways of having different events that happen. As I mentioned, the uh, peace talks is one possibility. So war, once it begins in this variant, doesn't necessarily end with somebody being conquered. It can end through a peaceful solution. And again, the modeling here I think is pretty great because um, there's a lot of nuances to it. And um, there is further a, um, an, a dispute resolution table that, again, is going to have an impact on what the current cultural status is, and that is going to add modifications to the die roll to make it more or less likely that, for example, a limited war will continue or that peace talks will be successful. So there's a lot of richness here because it isn't simply giving you the mechanism to move counters around. It's really giving you the mechanism to um, model the contours of an evolving empire, of an evolving civilization, which is what you would be encountering in the game as you play it. Again, as a society level game, this is a game where you can't try to control the minor details in an optimal fashion. It just doesn't work. It is a game about general policy and higher order movements. And despite, I noticed actually on the side of the box here, they call this an intergalactic battle game. You know what? It really isn't. I mean, the the individual sort of tactical um Ship-to-ship -ship battles, I mean, I understand from a marketing standpoint, you're not going to market this as, a, as an abstracted society game, but that's really what it is. And you can't control or achieve everything possible in the game. You're not supposed to be able to do that. Um, this is not that kind of game, and maybe any good game is that 
where everything is just slightly out of your reach. You're dealing here really with economics and resources and technology. There is military decision making, but it comes at the level of the choices that you make along the way in the production turns to invest money in research for what you're going to build. And here I'm just flipping through and showing you this is the back of the or an example of the back of how you would fill in the original star chart from the basic original rules and um, an example of their production and how they are developing their weapons, the missile bases, the fighters that they're purchasing. Uh, this is that CET I talked about, the technology that allowed you to colonize barren planets. But it is a game where there are no immediate results that you see. It is, you're playing for the long game, literally. I mean, it's literally a long game. And the way you succeed is through long-term strategies to build up your empire. And these strategic concepts have to be expanded over a period of years. And you need to put plans into place that will unfold during the course of the game um, in the long run. There's just no immediate results possible in this game. And again, maybe it is a sign of its time because it is structured that way. I found that for the solo play with the variants that I was using, it was pretty convincing and involving. Just ultimately for me, um, too difficult to put on video in a way different than I did. So that's it. Stellar Conquest from this version, the Avalon Hill version from 1984.